Now, after years of inactivity and negligence, Port Harcourt Refining Company in River State has resumed operations. The opening fulfills the federal government's pledge to bring on stream phase one of the Port Harcourt Refinery. Minister for State for Petroleum Resources Heineken Lopobiri announced the refinery's mechanical completion and flare start. Lopobiri, who disclosed this while conducting a media tour of the refinery, said this signals the commencement of production of petroleum products after the Christmas holidays. The board chairman of the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited says the commencement of operations at the refinery will stabilize the cost of fuel. Well, energy analyst Ademola Adegum uh, joins us now to discuss how the mechanical completion of Port Harcourt refinery will affect the petrol supply chain and availability. Thank you so much for joining us on Newsday. I want to start with some very important business today. I hear it is your birthday, so we wish you a wonderful day today and uh, we wish you a fantastic year ahead and many, many more years in good health and filled with joy. Thank you very much. Very kind of you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Right now, to the business of the day. So former President um, um, Obasanjo, Olusegun Obasanjo, is once quoted as saying that local refineries will not work because there is just too much corruption in the refineries. Uh, given these developments now that we're seeing in Port Harcourt, uh, what is your take on this comment that was once made? And do you think the necessary measures have been taken to ensure that this Port Harcourt refinery and the other state-owned refineries work? Um, I'm not sure if that answer can be given now. It will take some time to know that. So it's kudos to an NPC. Uh, the refinery is mechanically completed. And then there's the other part of it, uh, which is when they do the plan completion and then some snap completion. And then we test whether it runs. But the problem is not the refinery itself or the mechanics of the refinery. The problem has always been the policy behind the refinery and the administration of the downstream sector. Now, when Obasan just said what he said, um, we had no downstream um, re regulator. We had, didn't have a PIA. Um, we didn't have um, subsidy. We had subsidy in place. And at that point in time, no refinery locally would have sustained itself for a long time. Uh, this refinery is good. Um, we look forward to it working properly and uh, anticipating that it's well run, uh, the necessary guidance are put in place, then we'll see. Uh, I mean, I took some of my... Um, team members um, some years back to have a look at the refineries um, in Nigeria, protocol one and two and others. And the problem wasn't actually mechanical as per se. Yes, you can in it fix mechanical things. But the problem were more of governance issues. Uh, the power of uh, MW refinery to approve things, the staffing constraints, uh, power issues, and then the market for products. So it's a little bit more complicated than the refinery being compared itself. It needs a wider process to ensure that they are sustained. Well said, of course, uh, sustainability of this is, is, is the, the most important aspect. But now that you've highlighted some of the problems that um, existed at the, the preceding this um, um, progress that was made in terms of the problem of policy behind the refinery, problem with governance issues, staffing constraints, are you content with what you're seeing at this time from this administration that suggests that the history will not repeat itself in terms of the challenges that were was that presented themselves in the former. No, I'm not. I'm not um, satisfied. Um, I still feel there are a lot of work to be done. I don't think the PI is being well implemented. I think the PI is partially implemented. Um, I look forward to the government implementing the PI properly. I look forward to um, the regulators stepping up their game, both the upstream and the downstream and take their pride in managing things. I also look for some other governance issues. So NFPC is doing better than it was doing, but it's not done as well as it can do. So there are potentials. And again, just to make it clear here, the refinery will only produce maximum of 3.8 million liters of petrol uh, per day. Uh, maximum, maximum we can produce at full capacity. Our consumption is above 15 million liters as of now. So it's just a, a fraction of what we need. So even if all the refineries were working, uh, let's assume we have all domestic refineries working, we're producing about 10 million liters. So we still have a shortfall of 30 million liters. So there's still that information gap that is there. And that's where the processes, the policies and co-come into place. Because um, a refinery breaks down, 
when it doesn't have supply issues. And then with the level of oil theft you have, uh, the level of vandalism, the Dangote refinery coming on stream as well, there's a lot of competition for the crude now. And so things have to be put in place to ensure that it's run as a business, it's run as a proper hub. Um, I think there's some move towards that. I must commend um, the current leadership of NMPC Limited. But again, there's still a lot of work to be done. Right. And I'm glad you said that because uh, that's just speaking to the point that I, I wanted to you to elaborate on next, which is that we know that one of the biggest challenges here, apart from governance issues, is the feed, the supply of oil. Now, what are those modalities that you think need to be put into place in order to ensure consistent and steady supply uh, of, of product? Well, in the last um, seven, eight years, the industry has been uh, beset with um, theft, all theft. Um, estimates are between 250,000 barrels to 40,000 barrels per day or more, um, since we don't know um, precise terms. Cadena refinery, um, for instance, requires feed from worry to, f to operate. It's also about 1,000 kilometers of pipeline. The pipeline is basically unusable. Um, there's a lot of leakages, a lot of damage, a lot of theft. But ACOT needs supply because it's a, a refineries need to function and function. They're not meant to be idle. The longer they're idle, there are problems. So we need to stop all theft. All theft is damaging both the economy, the downstream sector, and the upstream sector. If you're producing less than 1.2 million barrels per day and you're losing so much, then there's work to be done. So I think government should also focus on solving that problem. The problem of the pipeline vandalism, pipeline theft, um, the, contracts, the, co the contractor pro um, contracts for uh, protection and the whole issues around the all theft thing. So it's there. If, if I were in NMPC, um, I would spin off some delegated authority to NMPC, um, to the refineries, to make more decisions. I mean, the situation whereby the heads of refineries can't approve beyond a certain amount of money, uh, where you order products for your refinery, uh, it has to be done through the group. You know, you order from Port Harcourt, it comes to Abuja, Abuja orders for you. Al along the value chain, things are misplaced, things are not done properly. Then you get the wrong order, then it stays at the port, then you bring it into Port Harcourt, then it's the wrong thing, a lot of losses there. So there's a lot of inefficiency in the system. So when you bring the governance model properly and allow it to be run as a business, allow them to take care of refinery as what should be. Um, refinery margins are very small. I mean, the best you can get on refinery margins is about 1.2, 1.13. So if you don't get the right model of governance, then in another eight months, the finance will break down again, and all the billions of dollars we invested will be gone. Uh, indeed. Now, of course, you're the expert here, but we, we understand that 77.4% um, of the entire Port Harcourt rehabilitation project has been completed, and that flare-up flare is scheduled for December 31st. Is there a crucial step that needs to take place before the flare-up that's scheduled for December 31st, or can all of these... Um, some of, of course, what you're recommending is more in the long run, but is there something that needs to happen before the flare-up that's scheduled for December 31st? Well, when you finish the mechanical completion of any um, equipment, you finish the mechanical. So what it means you put all the equipment in place as per specifications. So that's mechanical completion. Then you now do the snap completion, which is when you test alignment of all mechanical issues and ensure that it's fit for purpose, it's as standard as it should be, then you do the test run. And that should not take a long time. Um, typically that should take you, it depends, anything from 10, 15 days, that should be done. So when that is done essentially, then you, you cannot start producing. But then you also have to guarantee fit stock. There has to be certain, I mean, it can, the, the refinery is designed to operate at 2,000, 210,000 barrels per day. So you have to ensure that there is a uh, fit stock that goes into refinery regularly. Otherwise, again, we go back to square one again in terms of operational and mechanical issues. Right. And of course, you know, earlier we made reference to Dangote Refinery and, and we saw, uh, you know, some of the delays in, in getting going due to feedstock as well. The introduction of uh, Dangote Refinery, the completion of the project and us seeing them getting into action. Do you see this impacting the state owned refineries in a positive or a negative way? What, what is your outlook? Well, I think it, it, impacts, it, it impacts Nigerians in a positive way. So it's for Nigerians, it's a good deal because um, Dangote Refinery is newer and should be more efficient and uh, should be, uh, be better give us lower values in terms of the cost of products, whether it's petrol or diesel or um, high profile or whatever. Now, for the local refinery, like I said, it's 10,000 barrels per day that I can take, um, granting you 
anything between 3.8 to 4 million liters at full efficiency. And then it's, it's older. And of course, when you start something, things start happening. Maybe the catalytic converter ha has an issue. Maybe the vacuum has an issue. Maybe the CDU. So things happen when you start operating that are beyond what you plan for. So Dangote, in a way, makes our refineries a little bit more obsolescent than it should be. Um, like a lot of people have said, and a lot of people have said, as soon as the government gets the refinery running, it should get rid of it. Um, people don't like when they hear that. But the, the government um, hasn't shown the capacity to run the refineries efficiently. Like I said, the margins are very marginal and very tiny. And when you have the bottle up neck, bottleneck structures in terms of approvals, um, uh, approval limits, um, purchasing procurement issues, it's not going to work as well. But Dangote is a good advantage for all of us in Nigeria. Uh, we'll earn more revenue and it's functional efficient. NFPC um, had bought into Dangote. So uh, again, it was a good move to do that um, for, for, for Nigeria. Now, as we begin to round up with you, of course, you mentioned what some of the issues or your concerns um, is oil theft. And the chief of defense staff, that's Christopher Musa, just a few days ago, about two days ago, he stated that one of the major reasons that the um, military is having issues stopping the oil theft is because in those regions, um, the communities protect those carrying out the oil bunkering and also help to rebuild illegal oil refineries whenever the military personnel destroy them. What type of strategy would you like to see to address that aspect? so that we can actually make some significant progress in the long run. So oil theft um, became bigger under Jonathan. I think before Jonathan, we had, um, I mean, we have like 5,200 kilometers of pipeline belonging to an NPC um, and it's like additionals. There was only about maybe 230 punctures. Now it's over 2,000 punctures. Yes, and the community is involved as well. And that's why the PIA, um, those community section made sure that they were tied um, communities together. The, less, the more vandalism in your area, the more theft, the less your community gets. So it was well making the community participate. But then there's a problem. The real problem is the all theft management has become a political issue. It's not treated as a corruption issue. Um, the CDS uh, says people coll collude. People will always collude when they understand that this is politics. When they understand that what you do is you know who is doing it, you don't take those who are doing it, you avoid those who are doing it, you go and address those. How many people in Nigeria that are of that caliber have gone to jail for all theft? How many have you seen? So it's always the same. A new comment comes in, they mouth the same thing, or oh, we're serious, the MNSA sets up a committee, they were serious, but nothing changes. Because at the end of the day, politics is more significant in decisions being made than the all theft itself. So if government was serious about all theft, it could be done in a year plus. But again, you know, it's all politics. It's tied to so many things, so many issues that are complicated. Right. Now, lastly, before you go, you know, still keeping with the theme of uh, politics, managing that delicate balance between politics and uh, the function, the functionality of some of these industries. Of course, we know that Nigeria will need to maintain a delicate balance between supplying much needed, uh, well priced petroleum products into the market. But we'd like to generate revenue as well. Now, if you were given uh, the duty to determine how that balance will look, what would it look like? How do we make sure everybody gets something? Well, um, in the PIA, there's something we, uh, we call the domestic crude, su domestic crude Supply Obligations, DCSO, meaning all oil companies extracting crude in Nigeria have to keep a certain proportion for the domestic market. And um, it's a job of any PRC every year to announce what the DCSO is and implement it. Now, one of the challenges we have is the NEPRC announces it, but they don't implement it. Implementation is saying they allow free market buyers, they allow free market regime, which is good. But again, it's all a strategic sector. So what they should take forward is beyond announcing the DCSO, ensure that those who are linked in the value chain, who are producing, using the oil to produce, are allowed the right of first refusal. Then it now goes to the point of now raising production. So we have, we've got a cap of 1.5 million barrels per day now. Um, and we're doing 1.2, 1.1 at the best of times. We have a capacity to produce more. Now, if we did extra capacity for the locals 
and, uh, and ensure that maybe you got 1.8 million barrels by increasing investment, by increasing more licensing, by being more transparent in the way you issue licenses, by the acreage management systems and such, then perhaps we can grow the crude sector. But again, that's, there are so many things tied to it. So what I'm saying is every agency should be allowed to do its, ta its task properly without interference. Uh, political decisions should not be made in a critical sector like this. Uh, should be made on economic issues. And like I tell everybody, we, uh, we can probably earn more from downstream products. I mean, imagine when we had the short in. Well, imagine if Nigeria was supplying West Africa. Imagine how much it would have been making if we were the piping to Ghana, Togo, all the, all the, all the theft they were doing. Imagine for supply chains. We'll earn more revenue. We'll have a downstream which can create more jobs, which has more vibrancy. And then there's issue of gas as well and other. So it's not that hard. But I hope that um, the president... Um, get the PIA to be implemented properly, and that the new board of NNPC uh, take it further by structuring NNPC as best as it can in line with the PIA aspirations, and that both the option commission and the authority live up to their responsibilities. When we have all that going on, then we will be much better for it. Very well said. Energy analyst Ademola Adigun, we'd like to thank you for your time here on Newsday. We appreciate your analysis. Thank you. Thank you.